will go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to the Social Workers Confronting Racial Injustice Conference. I'm Tawandra Raukunsalo. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm happy that you were able to join us for this session, Healing and Justice Center, a community-based approach to public safety. Some of you may already be familiar with this, but I'd like to start by again sharing our university's land acknowledgement. The University of Wisconsin-Madison and the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work occupy ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called T-Jope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Junk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly, but unsuccessfully, sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the whole chunk nation, along with the 11 other nations, 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. I'd also like to let you know that this presentation is being recorded and will be available on our conference website at a later date. Um, and before I introduce our panel, I'd like to mention a few Zoom uh, information items. To access this presentation, you are required to provide your name and email. This allows us to lock our attendees and email you information on CEUs for this presentation, which will be distributed via email at a later date. Your cameras and microphones will, will, will remain muted for the duration of the presentation. Please use the Q&A feature where you can submit questions for our presenters. Please know that due to the large volume of attendees, unfortunately, we, won't, we may not be able to get all the questions to answer all of the questions submitted. Now it is my pleasure to introduce, to turn the floor over to our presenters uh, from the Healing and Justice Center. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks so much, Tawandra. Um, I'll start off. I'm Shimon Cohen. Um, I do clinical supervision on this project and have been, was involved with the start of the mobile crisis. And I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. Okay, awesome. Sorry, cue of like, who's going first on Zoom? Um, hey, everybody. Really, really grateful to be here for this conversation. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm a community organizer and a prison abolitionist and um, am the director of the Healing and Justice Center, um, really working on um, how do we uh, build a broader, more holistic understanding of what actually keeps our community safe and put the resources together to make that happen. Um, so really grateful to be here with y'all in conversation today. Um, my name is Tara Heel Swan. I'm the clinical coordinator for the Healing and Justice Center. Um, basically, we spearhead um, therapists that's under the Trauma Recovery Center, um, and we work with clients that are in our communities. And I go by she, her. I use she, her pronouns. Hi, I'm Shatara Thompson, she, her pronouns. I'm the program manager for the mobile crisis. I was a former crisis interventionist on the mobile um, crisis, and now I'm the program manager. So we're gonna kind of do this as um, a panel with discussion, kind of like almost like a doing the work podcast episode, but here we all are on video. Um, so just to start off, Oh, and I should have added, I use he, him pronouns and a visual description. I'm a white male uh, in my 40s, short brown hair, beard with gray in it, showing the that I earned that gray and uh, a green sweater. Um, so to start things off, let's just do an overview of the Healing and Justice Center. You know, there's a lot of programs that are part of it. Look, so like what you all do, the partners involved, the programs offered. Okay, amazing. So the Healing and Justice Center is a community-based public safety program. You know, we live in a society where public safety has been very narrowly defined as policing and prisons. Um, you know, in Miami-Dade County, for instance, where our program is based, um, nearly half of our budget, county's budget um, goes to the realm of public safety, but it, it goes to you know, police and corrections. Um, you know, uh, what we've seen over the last, you know, 40, 50 years is that while um, 
government social services have been cut in our communities. Our schools are underfunded. Um, public that we're living in the middle of a public housing crisis. Um, you know, people don't. You know, our government is talking about cutting social security and food stamps. Um, and meanwhile, um, more and more money has been flooded into the police, um, into into prisons, into expanding um, deportation, into war, and that those things actually are not making our community safer. That the things that our communities need are the basics. You know, housing, healthcare mental health care. Um, and that part of the reason we're seeing violence in our communities is because of decades of disinvestment of the social service safety net. So um, our organizations came together with really what did it mean for us to take community safety into our own hands, knowing that police and prisons don't keep our community safe. How do we take responsibility for community safety? And so um, we are a collaborative of four organizations, Dream Defenders, Circle of Brotherhood, which is a Black men's organization in Miami, Touching Miami with Love, which is a youth organization, and um, Dade County Street Response, which organizes medical doctors. Um, and we are working together to really build a comprehensive vision of what our communities need when it comes to safety. Um, our goals as a we're based in the Liberty City and Overtown neighborhoods of Miami, and we have basically three goals. One is around how do we reduce violence without incarceration? How do we divert people from the criminal legal system? And how do we increase access to trauma-informed, culturally competent mental health care to address the decades of trauma caused by disinvestment, caused by systemic racism, caused by poverty? Our model is really around bringing together basically the expertise of everyday people in our in our neighborhoods alongside the training in medical of medical and mental health professionals. So, um, you know, we all have those people in our lives that we go to when we are experiencing a problem, when we need somebody to talk to, when we feel unsafe. For me growing up, that was my grandma. My grandma was just the person I went to anytime I needed anything. And our model is really around how do we fund those everyday people in neighborhoods, the people that our communities already rely on, how do we actually see them as public safety professionals? And if they were resourced and supported and, and, and we were able to figure out how to get them to scale, how could we, um, how would that increase safety in our neighborhoods? So many, and also with the acknowledgement that the people that are best positioned to address to increase safety in our neighborhoods are the people closest to the problems. And so um, most of our, I, th I think everybody on our team is a, is a survivor of violence. Um, many people on our team are formerly incarcerated. Many people on our team um, are formerly, were formerly involved with group involved violence. And really that those people are best positions because of their relationships, because of the experience, because of the wisdom they hold from their from their life to really intervene in violence. And how do we um, support those people in intervening by matching it with the training of medical and mental health professionals? So that's really our model and our approach. And then we have a, a set of wraparound services that we provide in the community. Um, and really our, 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 our goal is that if we really um, invest in wraparound support for the community, that we will be able to decrease violence, we will be able to decrease crime without the collateral damages of incarceration. So we have a hotline, 1-866-SAFE-MIA. You can call seven days a week. Um, you can call that hotline if you are in crisis and it dispatches a team that can respond to that crisis. So we respond to all sort of mental health crises. We also respond to shootings. So when a shooting happens in our neighborhood, you know, the police come in and they do an investigation. They extract information to, um, to arrest somebody, but the collateral damages in terms of trauma, in terms of um, conflict are not addressed. So when a shooting happens, we send a team out to the neighborhood to do a wellness check, to check on people, sign them up for services, see what they need. And then we also, our team basically does investigation on what led to that shooting in order to intervene, do conflict mediation, in order to basically prevent further violence, prevent retaliation.
So we respond to crises and shootings. In addition, we have long-term long services that we also provide to, to support folks in addressing trauma. So we have a trauma recovery center. Tara runs that program. Um, the trauma recovery center is based on a national model around how do we support survivors of violence in the aftermath of experiencing trauma to help them stabilize and get the support they need um, to get their life um, back on track. So um, we do, it's a mix of both case management and therapy. Uh, we help sign people up for victims compensation. We help people with safe housing. We help people with um, all the sorts of things, legal support, all the sorts of things somebody might need in the aftermath of experiencing violence. So that's our trauma recovery center. In addition, we have a mentorship program really focused on how do we get to young people who are most at risk of experiencing gun violence, most at risk of being a perpetrator of violence, and um, support them in getting the resources they need um, to, to not partake in violence, whether that's mental health support, emotional support, um, you know, um, helping them, you know, graduate from high school, helping them get a job. Um, we know that many young people in Miami participate in violence because of poverty. Um, young people literally get paid to, to, to shoot people in Miami. So it's literally a source of income for young people. So our mentorship program is really focused on how do we get young people support, um, mentorship, healthy adult guidance, um, so that they don't choose the path of violence. Um, in addition, we have youth programming inside Miami-Dade schools. Um, you know, our young people are experiencing all sorts of trauma, and our school system is not at all equipped to help them process it. So we provide healthy social emotional learning to young people, helping them, um, you know, uh, learn how to understand their own emotions, relate to other people's emotions, how to de-escalate conflict, um, and really, you know, providing young people the tools and skills they need to stay safe. Um, in addition, we also do all sorts of trainings for the community. Uh, one of our theories is that how do we get the community the tools they need to intervene in violence? Like, it's one thing for our team to show up, but how can we give communities the tools to be able to intervene themselves? So one of the trainings we do is a stop the bleed training where we train community members to intervene um, and support um, and, you know, treat a gun wound, um, you know, knowing that ambulances don't come to our communities as quickly as they come to wealthy white neighborhoods. And so um, literally treat, training somebody how to bandage a gun wound can save a life. Um, so we do that. We're also... Um, do like mental health first aid trainings and things like that as well. Um, so yeah, that's an overview and um, really grateful to be able to share with you all. Before That was awesome, Rachel. Thank you so much. And before we go like deeper into the programs and you know more about how they operate, just to even go back a little bit in terms of how dream defenders you know decided to take on this type of project going from really like an organizing and advocacy um you know organization to now like providing services yeah that's a great question so um dream defenders was founded in 2012 after the murder of trayvon martin um young people came together across the state um in grief in mourning um, and wanting to figure out what we could do um, to bring justice to Trayvon's life and to address all of the ways black and brown youth are criminalized in Florida and around the country. And um, we basically planned, the first thing we did was we planned a big march um, to demand the arrest of George Zimmerman because in the days after Trayvon Martin's murder, George Zimmerman hadn't been arrested. And on that march, we decided to start the Dream Defenders. Uh, we realized there wasn't a political home at that point. This was before Black Lives Matter. There wasn't a space for young people to come together um, to fight, to build. And so we, we decided that we needed to start an organization. 
And in the first few years of the organization, we were really focused on how do we bring attention to the ways black and brown youth are criminalized? How do we bring attention to the injustices of our criminal legal system? How do we bring attention to um, the inadequacies and injustices of our policing system? And so um, most of our work was around direct action, protest, um, cultural interventions, really around how do we raise the alarm on what black and brown youth are experiencing. And, um, you know, over the first couple of years of the organization, we saw this ballooning and growth of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and in 2014, after the murder of Mike Brown, um, we saw that there was sort of this um, crescendo of both uprising around the criminalization of black of black youth um, and also kind of a break in public opinion a shift of the overtown window around prison and policing um, you know people were talking about prison abolition publicly like we hadn't experienced that I hadn't experienced that in my lifetime before and so um, in 2014 dream defenders after the murder of Mike Brown dream defenders was like hey okay everybody it seems like in the country is talking about prison abolition. What do people in our neighborhoods think about it? Um, what do people in Florida think about it? So we decided to do a listening project across the state of Florida where we went to neighborhoods across the state and really asked people, you know, do you think police make our neighborhoods safer? Why or why not? What do you think our neighborhoods need to stay safe? Um, do you think locking people up makes our neighborhood safer? Why or why not? You know, and, and really asking communities um, what they thought. And I think we went into that conversation kind of naively, thinking that everybody would say the number one issue is police and the solution is to abolish the police. And instead, um, what we heard was that the number one issue was 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 safety and, and gun violence. And that, you know, people were very concerned about how is my child going to get home from school safe. Um, I remember one conversation I had with a woman who had bullet holes in her car st still from a year prior when her son had been shot. And I thought, you know, who am I as this like, you know, young organizer to tell this woman that we should abolish the police when there's not an alternative in its place. And um you know, that really just called on us to like kind of evolve our politic, you know, that it wasn't enough for us to just be against systems. Um, we need to do that. We need to fight to um, divest from the police, to deprivatize the prisons, to decarcerate, you know, to decarcerate. We need to fight to, to tear down these systems, but we also need to figure out what we're building in its place. And what we heard from people was that like, it wasn't necessarily that people were super pro-police, but that people were really in need of safety and that because of the way our society has so narrowly defined police as safety, that people were like, we need more police, but it wasn't like they saw that as a solution either. And so it really called upon us to figure out, you know, what are we doing to build the alternative? Um, how are we actually addressing this need around safety? And so um, we were really um, blessed at that time in the organization to just have a variety of perspectives in the organization um, around what around around safety. So one of our members, Dr. Armin Henderson, had just gotten to Miami as a as a for his for his um, medical residency. So he had lots of thoughts around you know uh, around around safety. Uh, we also had a member, Adajare McMillian, who was um, in school to be a therapist. So he had you know brought us all sorts of language around trauma that you know we didn't have as organizers. Um, and then many of us became trained in restorative justice and circle keeping and conflict mediation. We had members who were public school teachers. We had members who we had a member who was a public defender. So we sort of took all these perspectives to really think about what would a comprehensive approach to community safety look like. And over the years, we just kind of like 
started different elements kind of one at a time. Like I said, we started doing restorative justice circles to deal with conflict within the organization. We started doing these stop the bleed trainings. We started a mental health program. Um, and eventually we realized that um, we needed to even as we're building this ecosystem of safety, we need to even step out a little bit greater than Dream Defenders, that there were skills that we had within the organization, but that there were other organizations that were better positioned around other pieces to, um, to help us think about what it was safety ecosystem would look like. So we formed a coalition, we brought in Circle of Brotherhood who does violence intervention. Um, we, um, you know, we launched this mobile crisis program under the leadership of Shatara around how do we respond to mental health crises without the police, and just over time really built the comprehensive model we have today. And I'd say it's like a really exciting time to be in community safety. Um, what we are seeing is that around the country, programs like ours are um, you know, for the first time ever, really getting funding and resourcing to be able to scale up our programs. Um, after George Floyd was was murdered um, and the uprising took place, the Biden administration actually put um, billions of dollars towards expanding mental health mobile crisis programs across the country to building out community violence programs across the country. So we are kind of in this exciting time where for the first time ever, our programs are being resourced. And what we're seeing is that, um, you know, in places where these programs are really invested in, they're seeing a reduc an all-time lows in violence and all-time lows in, in, in other forms of crime. In, in Newark, New Jersey, for instance, um, they have the lowest uh, rate of gun violence that they've had in the city's history. They have also one of the lowest rates of, um, of theft. And they uh, also have um, gone several years without police shootings because the community is intervening more. Um, and so there's less interaction happening with the police. So, um, so yeah, I just say that to say that, uh, you know, uh, there are more, you know, we are so indoctrinated to think there is no alternative to the police. There is no alternative to uh, the prison system. But actually in places where cities are investing in the alternative, we are seeing, uh, we are seeing actual results, results that our prison and policing system have never delivered. We have not seen a correlation between more money in police and prisons going to a reduction in violence. But what we do see is when we get communities the resources that they need to stay safe, when we put the resources in the hands of everyday people who are actually positioned to intervene to keep our communities safe, that we see these results. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And just, uh, yeah, excited again to be in conversation with folks. Yeah, it's like super inspiring and in part, you know, that it's part of this like national movement. Um, to bring it, you know, to focus again on like Miami, Liberty City, Overtown, you know, what are some of the challenges? You've you've hit on some, Rachel, obviously you've just talked about some of them, but you know, Tara, Shatara, what are some of the challenges that the community deals with, especially as it relates to public safety? Um, I've noticed that, you know, there's been a huge there's a huge impact and how they um, with community violence and how they are trying to process that community violence. What I've also recognized is people are actually opening up to the thought of therapy. Therapy was not a thing. It was not being spoke to, uh, spoken about in, in communities. So to have people reaching out to us, just trying to find out who we are, want to know more about the services we offer, like we are literally making moves in the community. And you have those members that are, you know, coming in and, and becoming clients that are spreading the word of the things that we've done to help them and how important it is. So I feel like the more we continue to um, not look at it as therapy, but look at it as support. And the, the thing that I love about the approach that we use is we prioritize 
um, case management and therapy at the same time. So if it is not a therapy thing or if they don't want therapy at that time, we can always prioritize what are your, is your basic needs that you need right now. What are those things? List those things, name it. And I've helped clients to complete victim advocates um, packages, just simple things that, you know, just interacting with systems. Like I've interacted with a child, child welfare system where a mom, they weren't even, you know, the case managers weren't calling her back. And it took a call for me to make sure that 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 she was getting just the bare basic needs of that system. And it should not be that way. They should not have to chase behind a system that already took, you know, is already causing them grief, causing them harm. And then on top of that, have to be re, you know, just re-traumatized by the system again and again and again. It's like a, a pattern of re-traumatization, but I'm also noticing that people are speaking the language of, of trauma. They know what they need. People in the community know exactly what they need. I don't need to ask them. They, they have the answers. Mm -hmm. And so the great thing that I'm loving that I'm seeing in the community are, are they are coming together. You know, we are seeing this new vision, this new found language that they are using to help to bring their mental wellness back to a level where they feel like they can function well in society. I also think it's accessibility to just, like you say, wraparound services, health services, mental health services. What I've noticed a lot is with the lack of accessibility, there's also trust because the thing, the, those things and places that are set up in the neighborhood and over town in Liberty City, they don't have, they don't trust the people or the people aren't doing what they say they're going to do. So they overpromise and under deliver. And that's one thing that in our organization, we, we try not to do that. We pride ourselves on not doing because that without the, without the people's trust, we won't be able to have this organization. It won't be long lasting. So one of our clients that we've had, we told her, you know, hey, we introduced ourselves, told her who we were. And she was like, I don't believe y'all. I don't believe y'all can help me do what y'all said y'all going to do, but I will try y'all. And she ran down every mental health service in Miami-Dade that she has contacted, and not one person has helped her. Not one person. They've always had an excuse where, oh, you could bring her here, or you could, oh, she's not answering the phone, not realizing her sister is living with bipolar schizophrenia, so that's not an option. So when we came in, we told her, listen, it's only limited of what we can do, but we can try. And with that, we built a long time, long trust for her. We've helped her more than any of the services that she has um, previously used before. So it's all about building trust and repair. Like Tara said, they know what they want. They know that they know what they what they hasn't worked and what is working and what's going to work. So just going out into them, just asking them, what do you need? What do you want? Is a makes a big difference. And also the fact that with the mobile crisis, they have somebody coming towards them. That's uh, accessibility here is very, very limited. Cars, streets, buses. We all know the bus system here does whatever they want to do. So the fact that they have services that could come to them, meet them where they at, which is a big thing, meeting the people where they at, I feel like that is, that's one of our strong suits in this organization is we always go to them. They don't have to come to the office. We'll always meet them, whether it's the corner on 17th and 7th or at their house, we'll meet them there. We do the same in the therapeutic realm, which is why it's, um, it's such a great um, experience for those um, clients. Sometimes, you know, they don't want to stay in the gun riddled communities that's keep keeping, you know, reminding them of the constant trauma that they face. So some of them look forward to just, we can sit in the McDonald's, we can go to the office, we can take a walk, just a different approach to, to mental health because you don't want that constant reminder. And sometimes your, your well being is just not seeing the same place that's constantly causing the trauma and the distress. So you know, they do look forward to those periods and times when they're able to interact with, with us. And we build rapport with them. So we do a long-term follow-up care. It's long-term. It's always, you're never not a patient of ours. And I think that's what a lot of organizations are missing is once you feel like, oh, you got your service, that's it. 
you, you should be fine. But with us, you got your service. How is the service? Is it adequate enough? What do you need? What else do you need from us to help you maximize the services that, that we're offering to get you back to your equilibrium? There's always long-term care and long-term follow-up when it comes to the client, even with mobile crisis. If we have a, if we do a handoff of long-term care, we'll still contact the client every two weeks, every month, however the client wants us, just to make sure, are you okay? Do you need our services? Are you in crisis? What can we do to help you? And if they're okay, they're okay. And if not, have knowing that somebody's there that's going to follow up with them, is going to care, makes a big difference. Just like somebody say, some accent how your day is, that makes a big difference to somebody. Accent how you feel, that makes a big difference. Yeah, and just to add one more thing off of what Tara and Shatara are saying, like Miami is ground zero um, for so many of the crises that, humans are facing in this current moment, you know, from the climate crisis, um, you know, we are in a very, very far right state that is constantly cutting social services. Um, there's a huge housing crisis happening in Miami, um, where there's exorbitant wealthy people moving to or the extremely wealthy, extremely wealthy people moving to Miami and pushing out poor people. There's a, so there's a huge housing crisis. Um, you know, the climate refugee crisis. So we're kind of like ground zero for so many of the challenges facing humanity right now. Um, and as the systems are kind of collapsing, um, you know, they're in Miami, if you are a homeless person, it is pretty much impossible to get housing um, or impossible to get into a shelter. Um, so as the systems in, are collapsing and the impact that is having on everyday people, um, our ability to be nimble, to meet people where they are at, to build trust with people, to build community with people, to bring people together and really meet their needs um, is, 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 really, is, is really important at this sort of like crucial moment in human history when so much is collapsing around people. And the, the sort of government solution, like our, our state is about to pass a policy that is about to make um, um, homeless encampments completely illegal. And um, which means if you are if you are outside <laughs> sleeping, you will be arrested automatically. Um, and there is not enough beds for the amount of houseless people there are in our shelter system. So you know, the government solution to these crises, again, is is criminalization, is incarceration, is deportation. And um, we're really coming together in the face of these crises to say, how do we meet people where they're at? How do we meet people's needs? And how do we help people survive these really challenging times we're in? So, so you you brought up so many things that I have other questions about, but um, and we might we probably won't be able to get into everything. But I, you know, just thinking about folks who are who are watching, who are listening, who will be listening to the recording, um, and thinking about like maybe they want to create programs like this in their community. Um, just getting a little deeper into how the programs function, you know, and starting with mobile crisis, um. And also this idea of like government, because I'll just add in real quick before I turn it over to you all is like, you know, we did first approach the county to create the mobile crisis, right? Like the idea in the beginning was that they would help as a progressive um, leadership, so to speak, in the county and maybe be willing to take on. And we ran into a lot of roadblocks, right, with that, that they would not do this without police being on every single crisis call. And we we wouldn't do that, right? We were gonna say it's gonna be a medical person and a crisis interventionist together going out. So I just wanted to put that out there because for folks who might be looking into creating this, that is, that is one model that keeps getting put out there is pairing a social worker or a therapist with a police officer. And that's not what this program, that's not what we're doing with this program. Um, that's we're not doing co-response. We're doing like a mental health first type response with medical professionals and crisis interventionists. So I just want to throw that out there and maybe then you all can get more into like how the mobile 
crisis, you know, functions and operates in a way that folks listening might have some ideas of how they could do something similar. Okay, great. So the last Shimon said the mobile crisis, we run on a response of a crisis interventionist and a medic. We do not respond on the side of police officers or with police officers. We every our every response that we do go to is through our hotline, the 1866 Safe MIA. When we go out to respond to any crises, mental health crises, the medic always goes on the scene first just to make sure that there isn't any medical um, emergencies that are masked as psychosis or mental health problems. Because we have had a patient where her UTI, long-term long -term UTI for a couple of months, and that turned into psychosis. So our medic always goes to make sure that it's medically clear. Our medics can range from anywhere from CNAs, LPNs, RNs, EMTs, any, anybody that's licensed in the state of Florida. Um, our crisis interventionist goes in to do any de-escalation techniques, um, any suicidal ideation planning, and, that's, and that sort. We deal with um, a variety of mental health crises, such as um, grief and loss counseling, child and abuse, neglect um, cases, welfare checks, um, mental health crises, and um, homelessness related um, crises, such as trying to get them back on their meds, trying to do um, medical care as in trench foot. I don't know if guys have heard of trench foot or saw it. It's not a pretty looking thing, but it's when those that are unhoused um, keep their socks or um, shoes on for a long period of time with moisture and it could deteriorate the skin. So we deal with a lot of um, unhoused with unhoused related issues. The, um, we believe that it's autonomy. So our, our main goal is to have the patient autonomy. We do not do anything the patient doesn't want to do. We don't work if the, the patient doesn't want the police call, we're not going to call the police. If the patient doesn't want to go to crises, we're not going to take them to crises. We're going to do find different ways, different techniques to help that patient so they don't become traumatized. Because as we all know, <clears throat> being Baker acted by the police is a traumatizing experience, especially uh, under a problem for black and brown people in this community. So to negate that, it's, we try to empower our patients to, for autonomy to be, to meet them where they're at, to get the name, like Tara said, they know their needs. So how can we help you achieve those needs? We, um, we only deal with the police if met and met necessary, that's the last resort to anything if we couldn't find other ways. And even then we have a system where we have to call our clinical supervisor, we call Rachel, we debrief really quick to make that decision on are we going to take them to crisis. So far, we've only had to call one time to have a patient Baker Act it so far. And they were in, weren't in our county, they were in Broward County. And then we've had two voluntary Baker acts. So if they told, they came to us and was like, if you don't take me to the hospital right now, I'm going to kill myself or kill somebody out here. And so they was like, oh, and we asked them, we have a series of questions. Are you going to jump out of our van if we take you to crises or different things like that? And we transport them to crises. We worked where um, a, we were driving and somebody flagged us down because they had a patient that was having a suicidal ideations, was threatening to harm himself, not others, just to harm himself. They told us they called the police two hours ago. The police never show, hasn't did show up. We came before the police came, and we just just because we just happened to drive by that that area. And ironically, when we pulled up, maybe 10, 15 minutes later, the police came. They assessed the situation and let us handle the situation and we were able to transport him to VA and not re-traumatize him for going in the back of a police car just to get some help. We don't believe that you should be traumatized to get your basic needs to get your help. Police should not be responding to mental health crises because that's just forced on something that you're already terrified. That just brings more trauma, more ter terrorization to that person. So yeah, the mobile crisis, we run mon Monday through Saturday, 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. We have a contract with NAP 988, the National Suicide Hotline. So our hours are in line with their um, peak hours in Overtown and Liberty City. They said that they see an uh, uh, increase in mental health calls through 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. So we set our hours to, to wrap around their services from 988, so we'll be, avail be available. Thank you so much, Shatara. That's 
so helpful, you know, and that's a great example of the police not coming for two hours and then showing up and letting you all handle it because they know, you know, at a certain level, they know too. Um, there are, I just want to put it out there. There are Q and A, there is a Q and A. So if folks have questions, you can type in the Q and A and we're going to leave about 15 to 20 minutes at the end to go over the, those questions. Um, so we will do our best to get to all of them at the end. Um, Rachel, do you want to talk about some of the models that, you know, where the some of the trainings that happened to create the mobile crisis, you know, um, initially, right, there was like some New Jersey going out to Oakland, some of that? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm trying to think of where to begin. But yeah, I mean, like I said, we're a part of like a really exciting moment where, you um, programs are receiving kind of public recognition and there's sort of an opening around safety outside of police and prisons. So in the development of the Healing and Justice Center, we have the opportunity to sort of travel and look at different models um, and kind of think about what we wanted to bring back to Miami. So one of the programs we visited was the Newark Community Street Team, which was actually a program funded by Mayor Raz Baraka. When he became mayor, he was like, how do I take money away from the police and put it towards a community approach to safety? And so they have a very comprehensive, similar to our program, set of programs that work together around um, community safety. Um, uh, we also had the opportunity, we learned a lot from CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon, which is a program that has existed since the 1970s around they do mental health mobile crisis. And basically in Eugene, if you call 911, um, calls are diverted directly from 911 to this community organization, CAHOOTS, that goes out, responds um, without the police, um, and then is able to get folks access to the long-term services that CAHOOTS provides. Um, we also had the opportunity to visit a program in Oakland called MACRO, um, which is also you know, a mental health mobile crisis response. Um, in addition, we're learning a lot from um, a national model around this trauma recovery center. Um, it originally came out of the University of San Francisco around how to increase access to services for survivors of violence. Um, and there are now trauma recovery centers all across the country, some of which are hospital based and some of which are community based like ours. Um, and then in addition, we're learning a lot um, from the community violence intervention model, which is around violence intervention. How do we really focus on actually the one, like if you look at most communities, there's 1% of the community that is actually engaging in gun violence. So the community violence intervention model is around how do we get to that 1% and um, support them in choosing an alternative life path. Um, and in communities where they focus on that 1%, they've been able to see a huge reduction in violence and shootings. So we're really lucky to be kind of part of this moment where there are evidence-based models across the country, uh, models that are working completely outside the policing system um, and are seeing real results. Um, and it's quite frustrating because in Miami, there's still very much this dominant view around police have to have some amount of involvement, despite the success of these other models across the country. So as Shimon said, you know, when we went to the county, they just could not comprehend what it would look like to do this without police involvement. You know, it was actually quite ironic because one of the things that they named was that they were afraid around being sued. Like if somebody calls 911 and they're expecting a police officer, but a social worker shows up, we're going to get sued. Well, the reality is, police get sued all the time now. Like the county has to give out millions of dollars because of in lawsuit settlements, because of police mis misconduct, because of police misuse of force. So um, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, the even just pulling out the contradictions that exist in their arguments, there's just still such a dominant view um, that the police have to be involved. But what the studies show is that like in all the programs where police are being used alongside a social worker, they aren't effective because the community still experiences that as a police officer. And ultimately the police officer is still the one in power, in the power, in power and 
the between them and the social worker. And this all of their training is around to see somebody as a threat rather than as somebody who needs help. So, um, you know, we really had to say, just how do we take this into our own hands? You know, we can't wait for the county to adopt this. Like our community's in crisis, our communities need an alternative now. Um, and so we've just been basically studying, learning a lot inside these evidence, other evidence-based programs around the country and really taking the best of that and bringing it back to Miami. And as Rachel said, you know, with the police, we don't go out with any weapons. The only weapon we have, which is not really a weapon, is mace. <laughs> and then we have protocols like we're going to mace a dog before we mace a person. So what the, what you know, how the police act like, oh, you can't go out there without, you know, weapons. We have to be in defense mode at all times. That's simply not true. If you have, if you, if you have people who look like you responding to crises, then you'll feel just a little bit better because they might have gone through the same thing that you have went through. You might, they might have the same struggles that you go through. So going out into these communities over town, Liberty City, without guns, without any weapons, should prove that it is a, it is a possibility. It's not dangerous. It's not, it's dangerous, but it's not dangerous and you will, for police to be needing weapons, for police to use the force that they do, for police to traumatize these people. All they need is a little love and compassion. Yeah, that was something that really, like, was eye-opening to me when we were in some of these uh, Zoom calls, like, a few years ago, you know, with, like, the like some of the police, some of the people in the uh, county government, some of the lawyers, and I remember one of the lawyers saying something about, like, every call is a threat, right, because it was all about, like, liability, they were, like, we can't justify someone calling 911 and then not having a police officer be on the call. And I just remember thinking, and I, I asked them this, I said, do you know how many social workers and mental health professionals are actually doing home visits all over Miami-Dade County every day, going into people's home, assessing the threat? First of all, not expecting a threat, but being ready for, you know, being trained and prepared, but not already going in there like with a gun drawn, you know, for example, and being ready to draw a gun, because we heard some stories about that um, with police. And, 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 and it goes fine, you know, and so and like this, this, van, the van now going out. So this was before the van started up going out. And I remember Armin just said, we're going to start it, we're doing it. You know, we're not waiting for you all to figure it out. Clearly, you all are not going to do it the way we're trying to show you with all these other programs across the country. And it was like, let's just go. We're, we're doing this. You know, we have the training, we have the capacity, and we're going to do it. Um, to get into a little bit about the Trauma Recovery Center and that model, you know, let's get a little more into those details. Tara, you shared, you know, some about that. Um, the idea that it's there's uh, clinicians, but then those clinicians also can do clinical case management. And it's it's very different, right, than typical mental health where those services like wouldn't be billable services, right? So those can't happen by the same clinician. So maybe you could just talk, kind of talk about that work and what you see people dealing with. And also you say like a lot of the people know what they need. So maybe also sharing a little bit about what you hear from folks about what they need. Yeah, sure. Um, and to, to this approach, this, like I said, this is an approach where to me, it's making something less overwhelming for a client because you don't, you don't want to have a client having to worry about the basics. Like, how do I, I need to figure out how to sign up for food stamps. I need to get my child in school. I, like I have all these other things and demands of myself. That, and, and on top of that, I feel like I'm depressed. I'm going through anxiety. And so with us coming in and assisting them with these, basic functions, bringing them groceries. They are super grateful for those things. And they, you know, they have expressed like, I've never, we've never had a therapist, one, that looks like you, two, that actually cares and actually advocates. I had a client where she called me, she calls me for everything now. <laughs> she, she calls me her voice. And I told her, you, 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 you are the voice. 
But of course, in that moment, I intervened because it, it, again, it's related to a system. The system says that, oh, her refrigerator was broken and they didn't know when they were gonna go out to the home. So I called the leasing office myself. And I told him, this is a bare minimum requirement of you guys to make sure that someone has a refrigerator and so that their food doesn't go spoiled. And you're telling this client that you don't know when you're gonna be able to, to, to fix the refrigerator. Well, after the back and forth, I can tell you her refrigerator is fixed within the hour of me making sure that there was a process in place, me even letting them know if this isn't resolved, we may have to look at other alternatives and, and you know, <laughs> escalate this because this is not okay to treat people this way. And clients have said it all the time. They don't care. They don't care. They know right away when someone cares. And that's the thing. We have to be very trustworthy in the community because that's the only way that we're going to get through to the clients that communities are going to start shifting because then when they see us, they're always like, oh, I know you. You're that from such and such. Mm -hmm. I remember when you all helped my brother and I referred others to you all. Mm -hmm. And so those are the stories, you know, that make me want to continue to do the work. And again, prioritizing. So I had a victim that, you know, came in because he was shot accidentally. I think it actually came through the mobile crisis mm -hmm. as a referral. Um, and I helped him do the victim's compensation form. And because he had a criminal record, he was denied. How, and you know, it, it, it really sat with me the way that we, re-victimized people. He spent his time in jail. He did everything that was required of him. When do we end? At what point do we say this person has, has, has been redeemed? Mm -hmm. Like who's the redeemer? Why do we keep punishing people for things that, okay, you, you, I will, you, he spent his time in jail. That should not be something that is being used against him at this point. So you know, and I know it was very disheartening because one, just to have a criminal record, he lost his, he ended up losing his job. And so we're going back to basic necessities here where therapy right now is not, a, is not a, something in the forefront. Right now we're working with trying to get you employment, you know, referring to Circle of Brotherhood, which is another good resource to assist us with, you know, bringing in people who look like who look like us, mm -hmm. who, you know, people that have actually lived the street life and is and are now reformed. Who's a better teacher? And so uh, you know, being I I love I like the, the way that things are set up. It's like a well-oiled machine. You know, we get referrals from the uh, mobile crisis unit and from COB, which is the circle of brotherhood. And so there is an assessment that's done. We also have a criteria. Um you know, we work with clients that are 14 years and older. They had to have been impacted by gun violence within the last three years. So violence in itself. So that could be domestic violence, sexual assault, um, human trafficking. So I've had an array of different clients that I've worked with. Um, and I go to their homes, go to their, go to the neighborhoods, never had an issue. They know when you're coming. They feel your energy. So they'll already know if you're coming in defense mode. And that's the thing. We have to let our guards down a bit to be able to get through those layers because trust with them is trust with anyone that's been through trauma is not easy. And you really have to go in. You have to very much so be one empathetic, sympathetic, and be real. They can sense it. And so, you know, I love that when they say, you know, I never had someone that looks like me that cared or that came to my home, you know, that's always there when I need them. And so we want to, we want to continue doing that and we want to spread that. We want to be the blueprint for what care in the community looks like. That's all. Awesome. That's so amazing. So powerful. Um, and Rachel, did you want to add something or, um, okay. 
so we have like a, a bunch of questions coming in. And so I was thinking actually, rather than waiting a little bit longer, maybe we could start talking about some of those now because um, there might be more. And also then we can even, you know, then we can, this might get us talking about other stuff. We can always come back to some of our original, you know, stuff we had planned. So a bunch of people have asked, I'll call it, I'll kind of moderate the um, Q and A, but a bunch of people have asked about funding, like, how is this funded? Um, someone asked, like, if there are specific research, if there's specific research that could be shared um, that would be helpful in supporting work in diverting from policing because Mad the Madison area is seeking to use public dollars to build a new $50 million police facility. Um, so just a bunch of those have been around, like, funding or research to, like, justify, you know, uh, diverting money from policing. Well, okay, great questions. Um, first of all, I'll say that communities have been doing this work long before the resources, long before they had resources to do so. So there are examples of groups all across the country that have been able to like pinch two pennies together, no, re without recognition, without resource, and have made a lot happen in terms of creating safety in their communities. I mean, I don't know if folks have heard of a program called Freedom House. But it was actually a program that was started, I believe, in the 60s in Pittsburgh, but it was before the ambulance program existed, before ambulance existed, existed um, police vehicles were used to transport people to hospitals. And Black people were experiencing all of this violence just when they were trying to get to the hospital because police were the ones transporting them. So a bunch of community members came together and said, how do we set up our own transportation system? They established an organization called Freedom House that then became the sort of blueprint for the modern ambulance system in this country. So I just say that as one of like many examples of people in this country that are coming together with just the resource of, the, of humans and humans with heart um, and have made a lot happen. Um, at the same time, we are in this moment, especially after the uprising um, around George Floyd, of really demanding what we deserve in terms of in terms of resource and dignity for this public safety work. You know, um, the um, you know, in the same way that police have huge budgets, budgets where they're able to offer pensions to police officers to do this to do this work. You know. Um, many people in our community become police because it's literally the only job with job security and retirement plans. Um, and so we're in a movement where we really are trying to kind of, in a sense, professionalize this alternative safety work and demand dignity um, and respect and living wages um, for this work. Um, and so for Dream Defenders, sort of our trajectory has been we started with really no resources around this work, um, just the resources of heart and started kind of just um, folks on a volunteer basis building this out. Um, and then kind of in, uh, in, in, in 2020, after the George Floyd murder, um, the Open Society Foundation came to us and said, you know, we really want to invest um in alternatives to incarceration and we know you all are doing that work so they gave us an initial seed grant to really pull together the coalition and start to build this out um which with those resources we were able to really start to build the scaffolding and then um from there the biden administration basically um put out a big grant around community violence intervention really again like i said for the first time ever us seeing public money going towards this field um and we were able to advocate to get some of those resources in miami dade county um basically because the mayor didn't want to be on the hook for gun violence you know she just didn't want to like have to be responsible for solving it she decided to subgrant some money to a local foundation to give out to some groups so we were able to access some of those dollars um and you know i think we're in a moment where we have some money to really be able to build out infrastructure and over the last couple of years we've been able to grow our team from basically a handful of people to now now we have a full you know a, 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 you know an almost full size staff um and so 
But we don't take for granted that this money, just because it's here today, is going to be here tomorrow. In fact, Open Society, after you know that initial round of funding, then decided that they're going through a complete restructuring process and they froze all grants to all organizations. So we can't count that the money's here today, that it'll be here tomorrow, like I said. Um, and you know, who knows what happens with the election in November? It could mean that that money is gone. So um, I think we are really um, trying to balance both how to kind of build out, um, we have the resources, so how do we build out the staffing, but how do we also recognize that it might not be here forever? Um, and how do we set ourselves up sort of success for success in either scenario, knowing that our communities need this um, regardless of if, the, if it's a priority for philanthropy or a priority for government? Um, and then I'll just say, I think one of the other things we're trying to do to really ensure to, to, to set ourselves up um, for um, kind of to be in the best position to have power to demand more resource is really investing in the data infrastructure, like in the data and research, like, you know, how do we really be able to show that there is that these are not just that that there's an actual outcome from funding these programs, you know, in terms of violence reduction, so that we have a tool to be able to advocate for more resources. Um, so, for instance, in Newark, New Jersey, they were able to, um, you know, really be able to, like I said earlier, be able to prove through the data that there was a reduction in violence. Well, one of the things that happened is the second there was a reduction in violence, the police went to the mayor and said that, you know, there's a reduction in violence because of what we're doing, therefore give us more money. But because Newark Community Street Team had the data to be able to back that it was actually because of them, they were able to sort of fight what the police were doing and say, no, it's because of us, give our program more money. And then because of the ways they engage their clients, they were able to turn out hundreds of people to budget hearings to say, keep funding Newark Community Street Team. So I think there's a blend of like research and how do we, and how do we build the people power, you know, um, through really, you know, the trust that we're building with communities. How do we also get them to not just passively receive our services, but also see themselves as advocates for fighting for more resources to come to this money, to, to demand this money and to demand the resourcing for our programs. Um, so I think there's an organizing approach that we have to invest into, invest in as well, um, in order to ensure that this is just not a one-off sort of uh you know, set of funding, but that we're actually building the power long term to demand more and more resourcing for this work. Another a question that's kind of like goes along with this is if we have a compilation of research reports to support the work that can be shared. Yes, we can um, maybe get it to the conference organizers to send out, but we can send you some um, some of the research on some of these models. Got another question. Um, this is probably a Tara and Shatara question. Um, how do you how do you all depart from the typical medical model when addressing folks' needs, particularly mental health needs? Can you repeat the question? How do you all depart from the traditional medical model when addressing people's needs, especially mental health needs? Um, so like I was saying earlier, when when it comes to mental health, therapists in, in their in their model, they focus strictly on just therapy, nothing else. With our model, we focus on both physical health and mesh that with mental health. So we, and we prioritize which one the client wants to prioritize or feels that they need to work on more in the moment. So if it's not therapy at the time, then we, let's look into the, the housing, let's look into um, what you can get from victim compensation, lost wages. Those are some of the things that, what I have discovered just alone doing it with clients have helped to alleviate some of their mental health traumas that were going on. And so 
sometimes we're in a crisis and then that crisis is making us feel anxious. And of course, that's a normal, you know, response to stress. And so just, you know, just actually just doing some basic bare minimum needs for, for clients has helped them, their mood to change, you know, to decrease and, and not feeling as anxious because then they know, well, I have this person that's helping me to get to these resources that I, I've been wanting. And so I think we don't, we don't to do the typical therapy therapy. We do follow very much evidence-based models such as trauma-focused CBT models and um, the different approaches um, that is out there. Um, but like I said, we, we mesh them together and to me that that propels the client into feeling much better it's it's like treat it's a double treatment for mental and physical needs as tara said especially like in a in a mobile crisis a lot of the crisis mental health crises that we encounter are because their basic needs aren't being met for those that are unhoused of course they're going to be they're going to be in the middle of the street yelling because they don't have nowhere to sleep they don't have no privacy they, everything that we do in our homes, they have to do it outside because there, there is nothing. A lot of, a lot of, um, of course, you're going to be sad and crying because you're hungry or anxious or hangry. We all know about what hangry is. If you get too hungry, you're going to be angry. We all know that. <laughs> so like these mental health crises are, they aren't really crises. They are because they don't have their basic needs. So once you meet their basic needs, that crisis at the moment goes away. I'll jump in too, since, you know, I am involved clinically um, in the project. Like, I think one of the things about the traditional model is it um, looks at people as that something's wrong with them, right? Like there's something that needs to get fixed, right? There's some deficit going on. And, you know, there are like medical, um, there are chemical issues, right? Like, like that could be going on with people. And that's where we have the partnership with a psychiatrist, with the medical team, you know, with the uh, Dade County Street response. But the overall approach is like, there are these systems that are like crushing people. You know, there's violence that is like harming people. And if we can support them in healing and, and as Tar and Shatara said, in getting their needs met, a lot of the things that are called mental health, you know, are, are won't, it's going to look differently. Um, so it's starting from a totally different framework and paradigm and just how we view people um, from the beginning. It's definitely a holistic approach of how we take things. You know, like you said, it's nothing wrong with you. And that's the case, something wrong with everybody. So we look, we don't just look at, oh, you're angry, you're upset. Like what's going on besides you're angry, you're upset? We look at you as a whole. You Something might be wrong with you medically. That's why we have our urgent care. Something might, you might need employment. That's why we have COB. Like that's why we have these different components of our um, organization to meet the different needs, the holistic view of that person. Because if you just look, focus on one thing, that one thing is not going to fix everything everything else. Like Tara said, there's multiple things going on. I need to apply for this. I need to do this. I need to do that. So how can we help that person feel whole again? Not just how can we help them with their mental health? How can we help them with their medical health? How can we help them feel whole? How can we empower them so they could feel autonomy and advocate for themselves? Yeah. And if there wasn't racism and classism and sexism affecting these folks, like they would be fine. <laughs> a lot of what they're dealing with is because cops are coming in, shooting people. There's right, like there's so many issues going on that if those systems were, and obviously they're not going to just be gone. So how do we do all this while this is all happening, right? Well, we're all trying to pull against the system, and you know, like the things that we do, like if we have to work with police, that's us getting information from them, not giving them information. So we we are very, very cautious and in the way that we interact with these different systems. Because the systems are the things that's harming. So when they say keep your friends close and your enemies closer, yeah, but there's an approach to that. There's a way to do it, you know, play chess, not checkers. So another question is, 
Um, someone says, would love to hear more about how you've worked with substance use and addiction treatment and holding that along with self-determination. So the mobile crisis do, um, we work with a lot of um, substance use. We do have a harm, we do model, have a harm reduction model where we do do clean needle exchanges, we pass out condoms, we take people if they need to get STD testing. If you want to do drugs, that's your problem, that's your business, that has nothing to do with me, how can I help you in that moment? If Do you need new needles? Do you want to go to the hospital? We do pass out our Narcan as well. We do, part of our Stop the Bleed CPR class is teaching the community how to use Narcan, when to use Narcan. We do pass out Narcan to those that are, um, that they use substances. So, well, hey, do you use, do you know somebody who uses here's some narcan so to help you out that what you do on your own time is your business it's just so happened that i happen to be here at the time if we do our drugs we do it in the house they do their drugs just happen to be outside sometimes so that's that's the, really the only difference so when it comes to substance use all it is is to validate reassure and to help them in that process the circular brotherhood does have a um narcan fentanyl um op program where they help with those that are that have been that have been using substances and so we can refer them to the to that if they need to go to a drug treatment that's how we will refer them to the circle of brotherhood or we'll try to with our medical case manager Berlinda she has a lot of ins and outs with housing when it comes to either um psych or when it comes to substance use so we do have resources and referrals that we can't help them yeah I've also had um clients that um openly admitted to you know using and so with with that with that case in particular I prioritized and was able to get them into a rehab facility they didn't stay but at the time they said that they and and that's the thing when, when I say they know what they want they said that they wanted to go to that rehabilitation center to get clean and they didn't think that they needed therapy right now. So, you know, we, we, we prioritized that and made that the focal point of them becoming clean and then seeking therapy because you want to be sober to be able to, you know, use all the different modalities and actually take in the work and the, you know, just the psychoeducation that comes with, with therapy as well. So, you know, it's just knowing that we practice is reprioritizing what the needs are in that moment. And the key point that Tara said is, is what they want. So it's what, how can we help you? Yes, you, 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 you do use some substances. Do you want to, do you want to go to rehab? If not, what do you need? Right. So it's really meeting them where they're at, supporting that self-determination. We'll still work with people who are using, you know, uh, it's really a harm reduction model i do know one project i don't think it got started yet but the idea of like a sobering center right i know armin dr armin would talk about that was a project um right rachel because so, there's not enough there's not enough detox and there's not enough um this is another intersection with a criminal you know injustice system um where if people want to get sober sometimes the only place to go get sober is overnight in jail which obviously isn't can't handle that it's super dangerous especially de depending on what you're addicted what the person's addicted to um so we need more spaces for that as well more treatment um another question is how would you advise a group of people this is a big one how would you advise a group of people who have been discussing creating an org an organization with similar value services in terms of how to get funding getting off the ground etc well that's the oh yeah do y'all want to answer this <laughs> that's, that's, that's a you question, question. <laughs> Well, I just learned this week that critical mass, the definition of like critical mass to make anything happen is three people. So if you have one per, if you're one person with an idea, get two friends together and, you know, it'll grow from there. Um, I say that kind of jokingly. I did hear that this week. I don't know the science behind it, but, um, but that is really how we started was just a handful of people with a idea and a lot of heart and commitment to making that idea happen. Um, 
I think one of the things that was really instrumental in us, um, in us kind of building things out was um, visiting other programs and seeing, you know, in, in the flesh, how other organizations function, the models that they're working with, what their teams look like, and really just learning on the ground from how other groups had grown. Um, so I would just definitely, you know, um, support doing research on other organizations and, and doing visits if you can. Um, I think the other thing that's been really instrumental is being a part of like um, just communities of practitioners who are kind of like experimenting with these ideas and learning how to do it together. So one group I would really inter um, I would really um, suggest is a group called Interrupting Criminalization. They're led by an amazing abolitionist lawyer, um, Andrea Ritchie, as well as um, a um, just a, an abolitionist thinker and practitioner, Miriam Kaba, who basically have created this learning cohort of groups all across the country um, who are trying to build alternatives. They actually have a cohort starting soon of folks specifically interested in building out mobile crisis programs with an abolitionist lens. Um, so yeah, just the opportunity to exchange ideas with other groups, to share ideas, um, to learn from each other has been really, really supportive of our growth. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, we started with a small group of people, but pretty quickly on, we realized um, we needed to do some mapping of the broader community to kind of help us, um, you know, really think about what would an ecosystem of safety look like and who else did we need to have it be in the be in conversation with. So, um, you know, pretty quickly we realized Dream Defenders had a lot around like the mental health side of things. We had a lot around restorative justice and conflict mediation. But we were not the people who were going to be able to intervene around gun violence, that we just were not the folks who were going to be able to show up to a shooting and have the relationships to deescalate that shooting. Um, but we did know there was another group in the in the community doing that work, Circle of Brotherhood. And so through lots of conversations with Circle of Brotherhood, we realized, oh, we could kind of take what Dream Defenders is doing and take what Circle of Brotherhood was doing and bring it together and that there'd be a lot of power in that. So I would just also encourage you to do lots of other research around what might exist in your community and who are the folks you need to be collaborating with. And I'll say that like our orientation to doing that was like, you know, in some cities, I think abolitionists have been like, I'm only going to work with other abolitionists. Like people have to share our exact same politic in order to be able to throw down with us. And we were like, you know, it'd be great if everybody's abolitionist, but that's not where people are at. And so, um, you know, I think if we had had a very high bar for um, partnering, we wouldn't have been able to grow the way we've been able to grow. Um, and so actually bringing people into, into the room that we might not 100% agree with, but that we think we can work with and sort of going through a process of building political alignment, um, challenging each other around our politics, and then growing together and kind of coming up with a shared vision and working agreements and, and what are certain, some of the foundational principles that guide our partnership has been a really beautiful process in kind of expanding our politic and bringing more people along with us and bringing the right people in the room to be able to make safety happen. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and there's so many uh, rules and regulations, especially when you start providing services, right, that it's a lot. So you've got to have um, the right folks involved who can offer guidance on those areas too. Um, and that, you know, it's a, it's always evolving. And I think the other thing, Rachel, of, you know, to just say, like, to go back is like, with the mobile crisis, we did go to the county, right? Like we, it was like, this is a need in the community. This is a need in the entire county, not, you know, obviously just Liberty City and Overtown. And uh, Healing Justice Center can't take on the, I mean, how many millions of people, right, live in Miami-Dade County and how many mobile crisis uh, vans and programs would be needed to serve all those people. Like it's a huge undertaking, but the, the government didn't want, wouldn't do it 
in a way that didn't again that didn't involve police so at that point it's like okay time to do it on our own so you know as people are exploring how to do things i think you know we were willing to do that like we were trying to make that partnership even though there's probably a million ways we did we wouldn't agree you know um with the county government uh at that point we were trying to make it work at least for that because we knew the services were so needed they made it clear that's not what they're interested in doing in that way, you know. Another, okay, another one is um, on the DV and unhoused folks side, uh, this person saying they have data su to suggest that a lack of pet support services is a barrier for seeking support due to fear of being separated from their pet or leaving the pet behind. Uh, with an in individual who's engaging in violence and 60 plus percent of families have pets so they're asking like is this something that comes up like do you all see this when you're out working with people um issues around pets and uh as a barrier to services or what happens with pets if people you know are going through a situation quite honest um no i have not encountered any pet related problems, but the mobile crisis um, van does have pet food for those that are unhoused. So you, we give you food, we give you dog food, we give you water, your dog get water as well. Yeah, and I'll just say there's so many problems with the shelter system in Miami in terms of barriers for people to um, want to be in a shelter. Um, just the restrictions in terms of their movement once you're in the shelter your inability to kind of come in and out like a human and live life. Um, I think probably bringing pets in is another huge barrier. Um, oftentimes, you know, the, the shelters have very strict, um, strict rules around, um, around um, substance. Um, but by, you know, but also don't have the resources to help people who are dealing with substance abuse. So there's all sorts of barriers around people who are using, who are not able to get into shelters. And then just the limited amount of beds, like there are not enough beds in Miami-Dade County for everyone who would want one. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of issues with our shelter, with the shelter system that then um, makes it, you know, um, that we have to try to support folks in navigating. Um, and there's like limitations to what we can do when people just don't have access to something as basic as housing. So uh, I think one of the things we're trying to navigate is a coalition of like, what, what do we need to do to figure out a solution around housing? Because, you know, you know, as we've shared a bunch, like you can't really meet somebody's emotional needs if they don't have just a basic roof over their head, you know, like, or, you know, what kind of the, what Shatara said around people being hangry, like you can't help people, you know, uh, with therapy if they just don't have food, like that's why they're angry. That's why they're um, struggling. So I think that's housing is a big thing that keeps coming up and that we're seeing with some of these safety programs all across the country that um, we need some sort of solution around, be it a community solution or a political solution. So how do we build the power to be able to push our government? to really expand access to housing, expand access to shelters, et cetera. So we're almost um, out of time. I know that Tawandra has some stuff to do to wrap things up. Um, any final thoughts of something you just need to get out there that wasn't said uh, from the three of you? And thank you all. This has been awesome hearing from the three of you all about this amazing work you do. We're good. Anything? Yeah. Sorry, you wanted to add one thing? No, I'm just, you know, just looking and seeing from where we started to where we are now, it's just been an amazing ride. And um, like I said, we, we want to be the blueprint for this whole thing that we're birthing. And hopefully the end result and the goal is to see the crime reduction and know that it's the impact that we're having on the communities, as well as the communities helping themselves to, to alleviate and eliminate crime.
getting some comments in the chat just about thank you. This was amazing. We've got uh, a researcher who's offered um, to help out with research. Um, I, I know her, so I can make that we can make that connection happen after. Um, thank you, Dr. Campbell. And uh, yeah, just people saying this is inspiring. And so do you want to give the website out so people can go to the website if they want to learn more and get in touch? Yes, great, great, great. So um, you can learn more about the Healing and Justice Center at healingandjusticecenter.com. And you can learn more about the Dream Defenders at dreamdefenders.org. Awesome. Shatara, Tara, Rachel, amazing. People are loving it. Uh, Tawandra, turn it back to you to wrap us up. Thank you all. Uh, I learned so much. It's always so great to learn more about non-unitive approaches to public safety. I just have to um, end with a few things. Again, many thanks to our presenters for sharing their time, expertise, and valuable information with us today. It's greatly appreciated. And thank you to everyone in attendance for being a part of this event and for your commitment and efforts to confront racial injustice. Please watch for an email with the link to complete an evaluation on today's presentation and watch for a separate email regarding CEUs for those that requested them when they registered. Thanks everyone, and we hope to see you again next year. Thank you so much. Bye.